a big reason for, for getting them through was the 529 plans that we use since uh, they were in their uh, teenage years. Absolutely. And I know, one, I know both of them, actually, and they're both, they both come out great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Megan, uh, Joe's daughter, also works out in the Stadium for College.com family. So um, just a quick note of logistics to the attendees. I really, you know, we really want this to be a dynamic discussion with Joe, um, and we'll be giving a little bit of preference to the questions that come in from the audience this morning. We've gotten a lot of questions in advance, so we'll also be um, looking to answer as many of those um, as we can. Um, as the webinar goes on. So I encourage you all to take notes. It's a really exciting opportunity to uh, be with Joe himself and ask him questions. So um, on that note, there's three main ways um, to ask questions. Uh, one is you can raise your hand uh, on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, there's a little button um, on the top left so that you can uh, ask a question. Uh, you can also ask a question via the chat. Um, uh, and question box on the right hand side of the go to webinar control panel. Uh, and finally, if you're a big user of social networks, by all means feel free to send in your questions to the Twitter handle at 529 day and we will be monitoring those questions in real time um, and bringing them up uh, as we go along the webinar. So Joe, we had already we already have a first question here uh, on the go to webinar chat. And this is from Jennifer, and she asks, um, Joe, how does a prepaid tuition work? From what I have read, it is not an investment account. The dollars go towards buying certificates at current tuition rates. I have a limited number of dollars I can save for my son's college education and wonder if that is the way to go. He's uh, four and still a year away from kindergarten. What do you think? Well, that's a great question. Prepaid tuition is a type of 529 plan. There's two types. There's the 529 savings plans and the 529 prepaid plans. Uh, there are only a few prepaid plans out there right now, and they're pretty much tied to the state where you live. So if you live in a state that offers a prepaid tuition plan, then that is an option for you to set aside dollars uh, for college. There's also a prepaid plan that's tied to private colleges around the country called the private college. 529 plan, and that, that doesn't matter where you live. Uh, most people are probably not living in a state that offers a prepaid plan. For, so for them, only the savings plan is an option. But if you live in, let's say, Virginia or Maryland or Florida, then you have this choice between a prepaid plan and a savings plan. Some families do both. Uh, but, but prepaid plans are very particular. You have to understand the rules of the particular plan and, and how it's going to play out in the future. And, and one prepaid plan is going to be very different from another. So if you do live in a state that offers a prepaid plan and you think that tuition at state universities are going to be increasing quite significantly over the next few years until your child reaches college age, then you might want to give that prepaid uh, plan some consideration. Uh, otherwise, you know, stick with the 529 savings plans. They're the more familiar type of investment to most people, and those are the types that are going to increase in value along with the underlying investments that you choose within your 529 savings plan. Great. Thank you, Joe. Is there, uh, if, if people move, uh, are there residency concerns? If you, you know, for example, I live in the state of Florida. Florida is a, a very popular prepaid plan. If I were to move from the state of Florida, how does that typically handle, or is it state by state? Well, the, the prepaid plans always allow your child to attend any college. So even if they don't attend the state university, those dollars that you have in the plan can be used at some private college in a different state. You have to understand what the formula is to, to, to really see what, what that's worth to you when it comes time to go to college. If you move out of state yourself, you can stay in that prepaid plan. They're not going to kick you out of the plan just because you no longer live in that state. And in fact, in a state like Florida, by virtue of being in the plan, your, your child may actually have some in-state resident uh, qualification benefits if he or she happens to come back to Florida to go to college. Got it. Great. Um, so Joe, one of the you know, we get, uh, I think this question comes up a lot, 
from, uh, from family members that we've seen historically. And what is the best, this is the question from April, um, it's actually on the slide, and what is the best five to nine for my newborn son? Well, that, we do get that question quite a bit. It's probably the second most asked question that, uh, that we get. And it's, uh, it's difficult to answer. If there was one best 529 plan, I would not have used 34 different 529 plans for our own two kids. I would have just focused on one. But, and, and I don't recommend that anyone use a whole bunch of different 529 plans. I did it for research purposes. But uh, essentially, there are two things that you want to look for in a 529 plan. One is the prospect of a very good investment return over time, and the other is a plan that's user-friendly, that's going to be easy to start and easy to use and understand along the way. So as far as the investment uh, uh, performance goes, that has to be in line with your risk. Uh, different plans will be offering investment options, you're, you're going to have a bunch of different options to choose from. Some are riskier than others, and naturally the riskier investments are, are supposed to go up faster over time, but also could drop in value quite significantly if the market begins to crash. Uh, there are also very safe investments in 529 plans, so if you say, I don't want to take any risk, I only want uh, a, a money market fund or some other sort of principal guaranteed option, most 529 plans offer that. Of course, your return is also affected by a couple of other things. One is your state may be giving you a state income tax deduction for your contributions, but only if you use the in-state plan. Well, that gives an investment benefit to, this, to the in-state plan that you're not going to get with an out-of-state plan. And the other, um, uh, the other major factor is the cost, the expense of the plan, because that naturally will reduce the return over time depending on how high the expense is. 529 plans in general have brought their expenses way down over the years. It's a very low amount that uh, goes towards expenses in 529 plans. But if you're comparing two different plans and they happen to have very similar investments, let's say index funds, which really aren't going to differ very much in their returns, but they have different expenses, then you can be sure that the index fund plan with lower expenses will outperform the index fund plan with higher expenses over time. Great. Thank you, Joe. Uh, one, uh, one question that we have here that came in uh, the chat is, uh, and it's actually on um, the slides as well, um, can you contribute property, um, i.e. stock, uh, this is a question from Susan Founder. Um, to a five to nine plan, or can you only contribute cash? Only cash. Um, it's only cash that can go into a 529 plan. And so if you have your investments in the stock market already or in bonds and you want to move that money into a 529 plan, you're going to have to sell those investments first. And so you need to be careful. That sale may trigger a capital gain that you report on your taxes and uh, you may not have been uh, planning to sell those investments anytime too soon. So if you have the cash set aside in a bank account already, that's, that's a great asset to have to move into a 529 plan. If it's in the stock market or in mutual funds, then you need to understand the tax consequence of moving that money into a 529 plan. It may be, uh, may be spread it out over time, to be to lower your taxes over time. You know, Marcos, we see a lot of accounts that are set up now uh, by parents for their kids under what's called the Uniform Transfers to Minors Act. Okay. Excuse me for one second. We're having a technical difficulty. Yeah, Joe, I believe we've lost uh, a little bit of your video right now. Okay, are you, am I back? You're back. You're I'm back. back. I was, what I was saying was that parents have these accounts set up for their kids under the Uniform Transfers to Minors Act account, and usually they put that money in there to get a tax benefit. The money, the investment earnings now shows up on their kids' tax returns and maybe at a low tax rate. Well, that's money that they may want to get into a 529 plan uh, and 
they want to transfer that, but they're going to trigger capital gains when they move that money from that UTMA into a 529 plan. Got it. Okay, great. Uh, Joe, this is a question that has actually uh, just came uh, from two different people, uh, from both David and Joshua. Uh, and they are asking, um, essentially, uh, I don't have a child yet. However, that is a work in progress. So good luck to you, Joshua. Um, is it possible to set up a five to nine savings plan for myself and then once the baby is born, immediately change the beneficiary as my child? Joshua is asking specifically for Texas, but I think it's a question that we can answer maybe in general. And if you have any Texas advice, I'm sure you know that would be great too. Uh, yeah, and the answer is absolutely you can. And it's, uh, it's a great way to get started uh, when you expect to have a child in the future and want to get started saving for college is get that 529 account open, name yourself as beneficiary, have your contributions invested, hopefully growing over that period of time, and it gives you a, a jump start. And then when the child is born, you can change the beneficiary very easily from yourself to that child. There's no great hurry. You don't have to make that change right on the day that that baby is born. You have, you know, 18 years to make that change. As long as you have the right beneficiary in place, by the time college expenses are starting to be paid, that's that's what matters. Great. So, would you one of the you know David asked, would you recommend parents do that? So it sounds like if you have the the cash, it's a good idea. Yeah, if you have the cash and you're thinking about future college expenses, and you have it, let's say, invested in mutual funds right now, and you're paying taxes on your income tax return why not get it into the 529 plan where you're not paying those income taxes and you'll have more for college down the road. Great. Um, so Robin asks, uh, and I think this is a follow-up question, Joe, to you know, when we're looking at fees across the different states and trying to compare, she's asking, you know, what are good fee levels to pay um, and what is reasonable for a direct uh, sold plan. So I think Robin already got the gist between the direct and, and advisor sold, but you know she'd like to know specifically what should she be looking for in fees. Okay, well let's spend a, a second on this issue of direct sold versus advisor sold because they are different ways to buy 529 plans. A direct sold is where you essentially fill out the application and without the help of a financial advisor just set up the account on your own directly with the state and use the investment options that the state makes available through its direct sold 529 plan. The advisor sold plan is one where you are working with a financial advisor. Maybe you're already working with a financial advisor on your retirement investments or other aspects of your financial life and, and now you want to work on college. Uh, your financial advisor your, or, or financial planner, there's a lot of fee-based planners now that are very active in 529 plans. Uh, uh, they can help you get into a 529 plan. The, the, the plans that are sold through brokers, which many of these financial advisors are, generally have higher costs because those costs are used to uh, compensate your financial advisor. So there's typically a sales charge associated with those particular 529 plans. The direct sold plans don't have a sales charge and the states are very intent on minimizing expenses in those plans. And so we're seeing uh, 529 plans where uh, expenses to, to run the plan that are hit, hitting your account are less than one-fifth of 1% 1 or 20 basis points. That's a very low level historically when you look at um, where 529 plans were in the past. And it's also very low compared to the tax benefits that you get with these 529 plans. So low low cost 529s are out there. There's a lot of them out there, and so I don't think the expenses really is a reason to stay away from 529 plans. Great, thank you, Joe. So just you know, to for reference, for you know, I, I sometimes get confused with basis points as well. So you're saying there's plans as low as sort of 0.2 percent is uh, available. Exactly. Right. Okay. Great. Um, this is a question asked by uh, Richard Pinder and. I think it's one we also see a lot, and it uh, maybe we can actually break it up into two parts. He, he asks, regarding financial aid eligibility, is aid more negatively affected if owned by a grandparent than a parent? And so I think, Joe, maybe, you know, for starters, we talk about the financial aid implications of a 529 period, 
and then then maybe we you know then follow on with the grandparent question as well because that's, right, that's, right. that's a question yeah because uh, this is the this is the no, number one asked question that we receive here at savingforcollege.com is what is the impact of a 529 plan on on financial aid uh, and the rules are a little tricky and if you know financial aid you know that the rules are just complex uh, by themselves but generally speaking 529 plans have little if any impact on federal financial aid eligibility and the way this works is your your eligibility for need-based aid your child's uh, eligibility is based on child's income child's assets along with parents income and parent assets uh, a 529 plan will count as a parent asset and never as a child's asset uh, as long as that parent has to report their assets and income on the aid application. And so that's a, that's a, that's a big advantage over, let's say, a UTMA account, which is treated as a student asset because student assets are assessed in this federal formula at 20% of the asset value whereas parent assets are assessed at 5.6% or maybe even less in some cases. And so that's, that's where a small hit may come on financial aid eligibility is that 5.6% of the account value. On the income side, 529 plans don't throw off any sort of income that shows up on your financial aid application. And so it's a very beneficial asset to have when it comes time to report your income on the application as opposed to using mutual funds and selling those mutual funds and having to report capital gains on your tax return those capital gains can reduce financial aid elig eligibility by as much as 50 percent of the capital gains and so that can have a major impact so that's that's how 529s in general work now when the question there was about well what about grandparents uh, what if the grandparent owns a 529 account? Well, grandparent assets or any other third-party assets are never reported on a student's application. It doesn't matter if it's an aunt, uncle, it doesn't matter if it's a 529 plan or a bank account. Those assets are not reported even if they're going to be used to pay for college expenses. On the flip side, a grandparent or other third party who actually financially supports the student um, creates a situation where the student must include that support as income on their financial aid application. And as I said before, that income uh, can reduce financial aid eligibility by as much as 50% of that income. So a grandparent using their 529 plan to pay for college expenses can be generating this income for financial aid purposes that reduces financial aid in the following year. So it gets a little tricky, but the, but the final, um, uh, I, I suppose, uh, suggestion here is when grandparents open 529 accounts, before they actually use those accounts to pay for college, they need to talk to the parents about financial aid and how it may impact the student and financial aid. And if it looks like it might have a big impact, then that grandparent should consider transferring the ownership of that 529 plan to the parent because it could be treated much better as a parent-owned 529 than as a grandparent-owned 529. And most 529 plans, but not all, allow a grandparent or anyone else to easily ask that the ownership be changed in the account to somebody else. Oh, wow. That's, that's great. And Joe, when, when a grandparent switches the account owner, are they, would there be any gift tax implications or tax implications or not really? That's, that's a good question. There, no, there aren't because the gift tax uh, was basically triggered when contributions were made to the account in the first place. So contributions to a 529 plan are considered gifts from the contributor to the beneficiary. Now everyone has $14,000 in these types of gifts that they can make each year to any particular beneficiary and it doesn't get counted for gift tax, it doesn't, doesn't require that you pay gift tax. Uh, and also for income tax, there's no, there's no consequence of changing ownership from an income tax uh, standpoint either. And so it's a very easy non-tax uh, thing to do. Oh, that's great. 
Um, so, Joe, uh, we've got a question here from um, David, and he says, can you talk a little bit about what are the qualified uh, uses of uh, 529 savings? Are they good for books? Uh, so this is a, I'm sure this is a popular question as well. Are they good for books, dormitory expenses, administrative fees, in addition to tuition costs? Well, there's a very specific list of what does qualify up for 529 purposes. It includes tuition, mandatory fees, uh, and required books, supplies, and equipment for attending the college. It also includes room and board, but only up to a limit. And the college uh, figures for room and board pretty much set that limit on how much you can include as room and board expenses for 529 purposes. And also there's a category for special needs beneficiaries. If they have special needs expenses, those can be used uh, or paid, paid uh, from the 529 plan. There are some, you know, we get a lot of questions about this type of expense and that type of expense doesn't qualify. A lot of them don't unless they're within those categories. For example, transportation is not a qualified expense, even though the school requires that the student uh, go someplace as part of their curriculum, transportation or travel is not a qualified expense. Uh, repayment of student loans is not a qualified expense. So if you're using a 529 plan to pay off student loans, it really does nothing to help you tax-wise. And some of these miscellaneous fees around campus, uh, which are voluntary and not required of every single student, uh, are, are, is not going to be a qualified expense either. Computers is the other one I want to mention because a lot of people wonder about uh, students purchasing a computer for school. Well, if the school requires that its students come to school with their own computer, then the purchase of that computer does qualify. Most schools don't require specifically that their students come to school with their own computer. And for those schools, the purchase of a computer does, does not qualify as a 529 expense. Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, one quick sort of lo logistical question. Um, is a couple of folks have asked if we are showing slides uh, and we the answer to that is we are showing slides to the extent that we have had some questions in advance um, but we expect to make the webinar available after this so if there's a piece that you miss or you join late um, just by registering you'll have access to the webinar recording so hopefully that uh, eases some folks concern uh, if you miss uh, some of it you can go back and listen to Joe again <laughs> so uh, Joe, uh, you know, I, I know we typically tend to not want to ask, uh, answer specific 529 questions about specific plans, but, you know, this person says I have, uh, Jay's asking if I have three boys and th three Schwab, uh, I have three boys and three Schwab 529 plans. It seems to be one of the worst plans available. Should I move the money to a new plan? If so, which one? I live in Massachusetts. Um, and so I know, you know, caveating, we're not a financial advisory, but Joe, I don't know, you know, how you can answer Well, let me, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. Uh, <clears throat> number one, I'm not sure where the, um, the opinion, uh, how the opinion is actually based for that particular program. What, what we do here at SavingForCollege.com is we track investment performance of all the different 529 plans. And we have a methodology where every quarter we produce reports ranking 529 plans against each other in their one-year investment performance, their three-year investment performance, their five-year investment performance, and their 10-year investment performance. And uh, I can't remember specifically any particular 529 plan uh, on, in those rankings, but uh, I know that the one was, that was mentioned uh, ranked pretty high, at least uh, during one of those time periods. But anyway, uh, it's your judgment call on whether your 529 plan is living up to your expectations. If it is not, for whatever reason, then you do have the ability to change to a different 529 plan. It's called a rollover. And you can roll over to a different 529 plan uh, once in any 12-month period. And generally how this is done is you choose your new 529 plan, you fill out the paperwork to set up the account, and as part of that paperwork you say, well, please go get my money from this existing 529 plan and roll it into this new 529 plan. 
and then that rollover is transacted automatically. You don't really have to do anything more about that, and it's done. And then you have to wait 12 months before you can do another rollover unless you want to change beneficiary on the account, and then you don't have to wait. You can do it anytime that you change beneficiary on the account. So a rollover is an option. Whether you should avail yourself of that rollover, entirely up to you. Also consider the state tax consequences of rollovers. If you deducted your contributions on your state's tax return, some states will, will require that you move that deduction back on as income in the year that you roll it over to another 529 plan. Okay. Great. Uh, so now let's move. We'll, we'll have a question from our Twitter here, Joe, and I think it's, it's similar to uh, what you were mentioning, and it's from at Bremsey here. Uh, at 529 day, can I compare state plans and how to do that? Well, you can compare state plans. Uh, we, we try to make it as easy as possible on savingforcollege.com because we sliced and diced all the 529 plans and, and you can easily compare the details of different 529 plans just by going to our 529 compare tool. Uh, and select the plans you want to compare, select the features that you want to compare against different plans. So for example, expenses. If you want to see how state A's expenses compare to state B's expenses, you can do that very easily uh, on, our, on our website using that, that compare tool. Uh, but there are so many differences between 529 plans that it really depends on how closely you want to make this comparison and in the end, you really need to be reading this official program disclosure that the 529 plan makes available to you because that disclosure, and maybe 60 or 70 pages, you're not going to want to wade through all that, but that disclosure contains all those little details that down the road, if you say, well, I didn't know this, I didn't know that, well, chances are really good that the answers were in that disclosure statement that you really should have read before you made that investment. Great. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I know for me, I reading those disclosure statements are a little bit of a, a pretzel of the mind. But um, Joe, you know, when I, before I uh, joined Saving for College, I saw that we had sort of, there were two rankings that I think are important to maybe just, it's not a plug, I just want to see if you can address the difference in the um, resident um, sort of cap rating and the out-of-state cap rating, because every state plan has two ratings, and maybe you can just kind of address that quickly. Yes, well, you're referring to our five cap ratings, which is a, a scoring uh, mechanism that we go through and apply a score to every 529 plan, one to five caps. And we look at over 40 factors in coming up with our five cap rating of 529 plans. And we, we actually offer two sets of ratings for 529 plans. One is what's called a uh, non-resident rating, and the other is called a resident rating. And it's different because if you're a resident of that state offering a 529 plan, you may get a different deal than a non-resident looking at that 529 plan. Just because so many states offer a state tax deduction for their residents, some states may offer matching contributions for their residents. Some states may offer lower expenses for their residents. And so you should look at the resident score for the state that you live in and then look at the non-resident scores for all the other states that you might be interested in and in order to do that comparison of what we feel is sort of an overall somewhat subjective uh, rating of uh, the different 529 plans. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and Kimberly, so I think Kimberly has a quick follow-on question to, I think, two questions ago. So thank you for paying attention, uh, Kimberly. Uh, three boys, three plans. I guess this is related to the Schwab question. Is that the best way to go, or should um, he have one plan and change beneficiaries as needed? Either strategy could work. Some people may say, well, why don't I just have one 529 plan, cut down on the paperwork. If there's any fees involved, like account maintenance fees, I can minimize those fees just by having one account instead of three accounts. And then down the road, when I'm about to use the money for college for any of my three kids, 
then I'll just change beneficiary or I'll move the money into a new account for the right beneficiary. So you have the flexibility to do that. Usually I recommend keeping three separate accounts if you have three children. And the reason I, I say that is, uh, number one, if there are different ages and you want the age-based option that so many 529 plans offer, it's, a, it's an investment option that's tailored to the age of your child, well, naturally, you want different different investment options for the, the kids that are different ages because you want it to be appropriate to their age. Another reason is for gift tax purposes. I mentioned earlier, fourteen thousand dollars per year uh, per per donee. So, if you have three kids, that's basically giving you the ability to to do three times fourteen thousand dollars without any sort of gift tax consequence. If you open up just one account well, then you're limited pretty much to the $14,000 under those gift tax exclusions. And finally, I just think it makes for better family bookkeeping to have separate accounts for each kid. I mean, I'd, I'd hate to, to walk into the household where all the account statements are going with one child's name on them and the other kids are sitting there saying, well, how come mom and dad don't want me to go to college? And my name's not in any of these statements. Or if something happens to the parents uh, and, and, and uh, and whoever, you know, their survivors say, well, we didn't really know what the strategy was here. There's only one account, but there's three kids. Do they really mean to have just one account? So I just think it makes for better family bookkeeping to keep things separate and have separate accounts for separate children. Got it. Uh, that's, that's, that's great. So in relate to, I think, to the bookkeeping question, David asking, is it possible uh, to transfer 5 to 9 savings from one account to another to balance out the five to nine balance for each dependent. Presumably, you know, as you grow as a couple, you're you know better financially off, and maybe that that kid gets a little more money, you know. Well, yes, you can do that. You can you can essentially transfer amounts from one five twenty nine account for one beneficiary to a different five twenty nine account for a different beneficiary, as long as those two beneficiaries are members of the same family. And so, if you have your accounts within the same state's 529 plan, then it's, it's very simple for the administrator of that plan to move that money from one account to the other account. Great. Uh, Joe, a, uh, a question from, from John Mickelson here, and I think this is the first one we've got on withdrawals, uh, or maybe the second one. When do withdrawals need to be made from a 529 plan? If other funds are available to pay for college, can the 529 withdrawal be postponed until the end of four years of college? Are there tax penalties if this can be done? I would suggest that you not postpone uh, until the end of college. Uh, the tax accounting rules essentially say that you need to withdraw your 529 funds in the same year that the beneficiary incurs college expenses. There's no specific tracing, so you don't have to be able to show that this particular dollar came from the 529 plan and went directly to pay the college expense, as long as it happens in the same year. So let's say that you expect your child to, to, to incur $10,000 of, of costs this fall for college. You can take that $10,000 out right now from the 529 plan, and as long as it matches up by the end of this calendar year where you have enough expenses to cover the money that was taken out of the 529 plan, then the 529 withdrawals would be tax-free. Uh, or vice versa. Let's say you pay the expense now and you want to keep the money in the 529 plan for a few more months. You can do that. Just make sure that you take it out before the end of this calendar year so that you don't have a problem with matching up the expenses with the distributions within the same year. Now, you know, the IRS has been asked to provide a little more uh, flexibility and leeway here, and they have said, well, they might provide a three-month window after the end of the year so that you have a little more flexibility, but it's not going to be a lot of flexibility. So be careful. Make sure that when you get towards the end of the year that you do your, your planning, you sit down and, and count up what your college costs were during the year and decide how much you really want to take out of your 529 plan. Um, and you may still want to spread your 529 distributions over four years or whatever it takes, uh, even if you don't have enough money to cover all your college costs. That's up to you 
as long as you don't take out more 529 money in any one year than you have expenses in that particular year. Got it. Great. Uh, Joe, Robin wants to know if there are any 529 plans that give state tax benefits, deduction or credit to someone who contributed to the plan but is not the participant, I, you know, I guess she probably means the account owner. Uh, so, you know, if someone gives a gift uh, to a 529 plan, which we see this, you know, with grads have a fair amount, can they get state tax benefits? It's just sort of a... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it, this is a state-by-state -state determination. You have, you have to understand what the rules are for your particular state where you live. Because your state may say, well, yeah, you can take a deduction as long as you make a, a contribution to our state's 529 plan whether you own that plan or not. So if you want to make a, a gift contribution for a niece or nephew, and you do that, and the parent, the parent actually owns the plan, uh, you get the deduction as, as the aunt or uncle for making that contribution. Other states say no. If you're making that contribution, you need to be the owner of that account in order to be eligible for our state's tax deduction. So it's just a matter of understanding that, that rule in your particular state. Joe, is it is that a common thing, or is that you know ballpark? Is do most states allow for that, or most most states that? most states do? I live in New York State, and New York State for the longest time wouldn't would not even allow you to contribute to somebody else's 529 account. And then a couple of years ago, they changed that rule and said, well, you can contribute to someone else's account, but you cannot take the, the New York State tax deduction for that for that contribution. So New York State is a little bit different than most states in how they went about this. Got it. So that also applies, I suspect, to, to grandparents, because we had a question from Pamela asking that specifically for grandparents, uh, if there are any ta tax benefits for gifting. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, state tax benefits are one thing, and grandparents setting up a 529 account may, may be thinking, well, should I set up my own account? Or should I just be making contributions to the 529 account that, that the parents have already set up for the grandkids? Uh, the state tax deduction may be one consideration of which way they want to go. Uh, gift tax-wise, it doesn't matter. If a grandparent makes contributions to a 529 account for a grandchild, it doesn't matter who the owner of that account is. It's a gift from the grandparent to the grandchild for gift tax purposes. So you have as much flexibility as, as you'd want uh, for that particular purpose. Great. Thank you. Uh, you know, Joe, we got, we get this, we've gotten this question, I think, uh, from David, and I saw it uh, as well from some other folks earlier, from Marie as well. Um, and he's asking, Joe Marcos, with the recent media attention on skyrocketing college costs, an estimates as high as 400000 for a four-year private tuition, what are your thoughts as to whether or not a 529 plan is enough. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask a quick follow-on question with that, which is what Marie asked, and maybe Joe, you can address it as well. My son is in high school. Is it too late to start a 529, 529 plan for him? Do, do I even bother? So they're related, but we'd love to get your thoughts. Well, my thoughts are that, that uh, costs are high right now at college, and costs seem to be going higher in the future. Yet, most students are getting through college and graduating. So they're making it. Now, how do they do that? Well, it's a combination of savings, I hope, in many cases, student loans that the federal government makes available to, uh, to either the student or to the parents, uh, budget adjustments so that uh, money is coming out of the current uh, annual budget. Maybe vacations are reduced, and that money is going to to pay for college costs while the student's in, in college, or uh, gifts from, from relatives, from grandparents and other relatives might, uh, might work in there, plus uh, scholarships, tuition discounts. So, it's, so there's, there's a way for, for most students to find uh, their way to pay th for college and get through college. Now, you look at the projections of what college will cost in the future, my theory is there will still be a way. Because if college costs go so high that, that, that families can no longer afford to pay for college, then colleges aren't going to be able to operate either. So there has to be an adjustment 
in there somewhere. Now, I encourage families to save for college uh, because the more you save for college, the less you have to rely on financial aid and which college is offering the best package to your, to your child. So you can choose the college that's best for your child and not necessarily the college that, that offers the best uh, aid package to your child. And I think that's, that's pretty important. Uh, and I think 529 plans, in many cases, are the best way to save for college because you don't have to pay Uncle Sam a, a, a part of your earnings. All those earnings can go to pay for college costs. So it ties in. If you have a lot of money and you know you're going to be paying a lot of college costs, 529 plans are good because they, uh, they allow very significant contributions, over $300,000 in most cases, understanding, of course, that you may have a gift tax issue in that particular situation. Great. So, so Joe, you know, it's, I got, we had this question from Elise, and I think it's a really interesting one. To your point around potential uh, changes in education, we're seeing a lot of online courses and private uh, institutions online. So can 529 funds be used for tuition for distance degree programs through an accredited college or university that are offered completely online? The answer is maybe. <laughs> it, all, it all depends on the school and whether students at that school can apply for federal financial aid. So it's easy to find out for any particular school, just ask the school, can my student apply for federal financial aid by going to your school, whether it's online or, or, or not? Uh, and if the answer is yes, uh, we, have a, we have a federal code number, and uh, so students here can apply for Stafford loans or other types of federal aid, then it's going to work for 529 purposes, too. If the school says, no, we, have, you know, we, we don't qualify yet, we expect to in the future, well, the answer is, well, then you don't qualify for 529 purposes either. Got it. So, uh, Joe, we have a I think, Pamela, I think you were trying to raise your hand. I don't know if we got to you on time, but if you want to uh, raise your hand again, uh, feel free to do that, and I'll uh, figure out here how to, how to get you um, asking a question. Um, and to, to follow up on the withdrawals question, I know we're jumping around a little bit here, Joe, but um, you know, we're handling questions as they come. Uh, what is a, regarding withdrawals, is there a more effective way to do them, considering record keeping? Um, also, do the withdrawals go, and I think this is a good question, do the withdrawals go directly from the plan to the institution? So thank you for asking that question, uh, Rick. Yeah, this is a great question. So once you have, uh, once it comes time to start paying college expenses, you're wondering, well, how do I get my money out of the 529 plan? Because usually you're going to have some choices available. Uh, you can either have the 529 plan pay the school directly, and that'll go against your child's college account, or you can have the 529 plan make out a distribution check to either you as the account owner, the parent or, or account owner, or you can have the 529 plan make out a check to the student. What difference does it make? Well, it could make a difference in some cases. So, uh, number one, for income tax purposes, the 1099 that the 529 plan sends out after the end of the year showing that this distribution was made goes to either the beneficiary of the account or the account owner. It goes to the beneficiary if the distribution was paid either to the beneficiary or to the school directly. It goes to the account owner if the distribution was paid to the account owner. Now, that may not make a difference if it's all tax-free because it doesn't matter who received the 1099. It doesn't, doesn't appear on your tax return. Uh, but I, along with many other parents, have experienced these notices coming from the IRS when the 1099 comes back to me as the parent saying, uh, we see that you received this money, you need to justify to us that uh, the money was spent on eligible expenses. The IRS doesn't seem to send out those notices when the distributions and the 1099 go to the student. And so for that reason, I generally prefer that uh, the parents or account owners don't take the money back themselves, even if the money is being used to 
pay for college expenses. And I don't always like that the 529 plan makes a distribution directly to the school either because some schools will get this check from the 529 plan and adjust their financial aid package to the student. Wow. And I, I, that would be a very poor result in my, in my mind if that happened. So my general preference is have the 529 plan make out the distribution check to the beneficiary and then figure out how to, how to funnel that money to, to pay for college expenses. Got it. Great. Uh, thank you, Joe. I think, uh, you know, another uh, question that, we, uh, that we've seen uh, here is around uh, scholarships. Um, I don't think we've gotten to those, that one yet um, today. And what happens to a 529 um, when my child receives a scholarship? Well, when your child receives a scholarship, by definition, the money that you have in a 529 might not be needed to pay for college because the scholarship is paying for college. And so you could end up with more money in the 529 plan than what's needed uh, for college. So the tax law has a special rule that says, well, if you have more money in your 529 uh, because of scholarships than what you need for college, and you take that money out, you don't have enough qualified expenses to make that tax free. So you're going to have a non-qualified distribution where the earnings portion of that distribution is now taxable. Normally, that earnings portion that's taxable is also subject to a 10% penalty. But the tax law says, well, we don't charge or, or assess that penalty if the reason is scholarships. So whenever you take money out of the 529 plan and it's non-qualified because you don't have expenses to match it, and let's say it's at the end of, this, of the college career, my advice is, well, go back and count up the scholarships received along the way and use that as justification for waiving the 10% penalty. So in essence, the 529 investment, instead of being entirely tax-free, is partly tax-free and partly tax deferred, but not subject to a penalty. Got it. Uh, so, so that one is, I think, Joe, related to David's question here, which is uh, a, an interesting one. I have heard that a so my child does not attend college, or you know, in in this case, a scholarship. So, what are some ways they can utilize the savings, uh, him or herself, outside of gifting it to the family, which I think you know we know by now is an option. I have heard that a person can take an art class in France to learn painting in their retirement years um, or to learn singing. Um, is that true? So this is obviously someone in the arts, arts world once they get retired. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's partially true, so you have to be a little <laughs> bit careful here. Uh, <clears throat> number one, uh, no one is ever requiring that you take 529 money out at any particular time. So. If your beneficiary graduate, graduates from college or decides not to go to college and you have money in the 529 plan, you can just let it sit there until you figure out what to do with it. One thing that you may want to do with it is change the beneficiary back to yourself and look to take some qualifying education in the future paid you know, using that 529 plan to pay for it. So what is qualified education? Well, it depends on the school being an eligible school under the 529 law. And as long as the school is eligible, if you're taking classes at, at that school, the tuition that you pay and the books and supplies and equipment that's required for your course can be taken from a 529 plan tax-free. So the, the, the common situation is a community college where you're an adult, you want to take some classes at the local community college, you're not seeking a degree. You just want to do this because you're interested in a particular subject. So you're paying tuition and these other expenses. So the community college, you can use these 529 funds. Uh, however, if you're taking a cooking class in France, uh, it's, it's required that that particular school be an el eligible school, which may or may not be the case. And it's also required that, that you be enrolled at that school. So uh, you have to meet a couple of hurdles there before you can actually use the 529 for that. Got it. And, and Joe, is there a 
list somewhere of what are the schools that that can be used, or is that? Yeah, there, there there's a list. There's a, the Department of Education, ed.gov, uh, maintains this school code list where you can look up any particular college. You can look up foreign institutions uh, to see if they have a school code. And we also have duplicated that particular um, tool on savingforcollege.com. So if you're, if you're wondering about which schools are eligible, it might be easiest just to go to savingforcollege.com and find the school code search and use that. Great. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a good handy tip. So thank you for that, Joe. Uh, another, you know, question I think that is we're seeing a lot in the news, and Anne has asked, uh, why would a five to nine plan be better than a Coverdell, in your opinion? That's a great question because they're very similar investments in some ways. Uh, five twenty nine plans and Coverdell education savings accounts both offer tax free ways to save for college. Uh, and so in some respects they compete against each other. Uh, five, but there are a lot of differences and uh, uh, for instance some people will be attracted to Coverdells because they allow pretty much any degree of investment direction that you want. Just like with a self-directed IRA, you can open a self-directed Coverdell and pick specific stocks or bonds or mutual funds, whatever you want in there as long as your Coverdell provider allows you to purchase those, those assets in the account, you have a lot of flexibility. So, so some people like to do that. They like to, to trade frequently, which they can do in a covered dollar account. And they cannot do that in the 529 plan. But a 529 plan may be more attractive because, number one, you may be getting a state tax deduction for your 529 plan, which you're, you're not going to get with your covered dollar account. Uh, 529 plans offer some more flexibility as far as uh, the age of the beneficiary and the income limits. There are Basically, there are no age or income limits in the 529 plan with very high contribution maximums. A Coverdell only allows $2,000 per year for any beneficiary from any source. So that's it, $2,000 per year. And the beneficiary must be um, below the age of 18 and also uh, the contributor must have income below certain levels in order to put that money into a Coverdell. So it's more restrictive that way. Uh, but Coverdells are also useful now for K through 12 expenses, which 529 yeah. plans cannot be used for private uh, grade school expenses. Yeah, Coverdells can. So if, you, if you're planning to send your child to a, a private grade school, you know that you're going to be incurring costs for that. You may be uh, more interested in the Coverdell. And that down the road, you can always transfer money from a Coverdell ESA tax-free into a 529 plan if you decide that the 529 plan is better for you. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, and, and then on that same sort of vein, uh, and quick sort of logistical question, if you guys have outstanding questions, we've got about four minutes left, so you know, feel free to tweet them or submit them to the chat. Um, we have a question here from Martin, Joe, um, and it's you know an, another alternative sort of savings question. Could a Roth IRA be used like a 529 to save for college education of a person's well, it, child? It, it certainly can be used. A Roth IRA can be used for pretty much anything in a tax-efficient manner because you can always pull your contributions out of a Roth IRA uh, tax-free and use, use that money to pay for college or, or for anything else. So there's a lot of nice flexibility in the Roth IRA. Uh, and if, if you don't use it for college, you just keep it in there growing uh, tax-free for your own retirement down, down the road. So Roth IRAs are, are very nice vehicles. Uh, there is a big financial aid disadvantage, though, with the Roth IRA if it's used for college. And just like I mentioned at the, uh, you know, when we were talking about grandparents, money from a Roth IRA that's used to pay for college must be added back to the financial aid application as income, which can reduce that student's eligibility for, for financial aid. So be very careful before actually using a Roth IRA or any IRA for college because it can have a severe negative impact on financial aid. Great. Thank you, Joe. 
Um, and I, now we've gotten this question, I think, twice here from David um, and Scott. And I think it's one that's on everybody's mind. And we basically think, and I have this, and I don't you know, have children yet, but it's also a concern. How much, you know, how much is enough, Joe? You know, how much should we contribute to a 529 plan based upon a child's age um, and sort of a conservative ROI, given that we have retirement to worry about as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, go to the calculators. Uh, that's what these college cost calculators are for. So you can, you can, you can see what it might take uh, under any set of assumptions to, to pay for some or all of uh, future college costs. And on SavingForCollege.com, we have what we call the world's simplest college cost calculator because all you have to do is press in one number, your child's age, and then we throw in a whole bunch of assumptions and give you sort of an idea of what it might take fund 100% of that child's future college. You may be looking to, to fund 25%, not 100%, which for many families is a very reasonable goal, is maybe 25% of a private college education, maybe 50% of a, of a public um, education for a child. And in round numbers, if you look at it, if you start saving when the child's a newborn and using that sort of guide of 25% or, or 50%, you know, two hundred and fifty dollars a month is sort of, to me, a, a very good target uh, for a newborn. If you wait though until the child's ten years old or fifteen years old, then that number really starts to skyrocket. If you're going to try to achieve any sort of, um, you know, lofty uh, savings goal for college. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's good. Twenty-five, fifty percent. Because I think sometimes you look at these numbers and you say 100%, and it gets scary. And then uh, you know, parents say, "Well, I'll start later when I have more money." And, and I think the important piece you hear a lot of advisors say it's important to just get started. Right. Absolutely. Um, so, Joe, thank you so much. I think unless we have, uh, you know, we unfortunately we had a couple of questions here that uh, uh, I think Richard, you asked one. Um, we'll we'll get back to you on that one because we we addressed it a little bit earlier in the program. Um, so um, we want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you, Joe, for letting us pick your brain for an hour. Uh, if people have any last-minute questions, uh, I don't know, Marie, if you want to throw up that last slide, but um, uh, a quick question on today, uh, 529-day giveaway winner will be announced later today, so please stay tuned. Uh, for that, we'll be emailing you via email uh, with instructions to claim that prize that can go toward any 529 plan uh, nationwide. Thank you all uh, for participating today. And finally, a little bit of a plug, you know, follow us uh, for college information uh, and news. We have two Twitter handles, at Saving for College and at 529Guru, uh, as well as our social media properties, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, which uh, Joe just did a series of videos, which I think uh, you'll find very, very useful. They're short, uh, minute and a half snippets on everything from what is a 529 plan to talking about grandparents to scholarships um, if you couldn't get enough of 529s uh, today. So again, thank you, Joe, uh, and thank you to all our participants. Thanks, Marcos.